to Cinto. Uh, I'm working as a data platform engineer. Uh, I've been using Druid for a few years now, trying to cater to users like low latency analytical request and so far there's a lot of happy customers. So. Hi everyone, I'm George. Uh, I work on the Polaris data engineering team at Imply, uh, trying to manage all of our customers' clusters and auto scaling and responding to any issues with the clusters. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Hopp. I'm a solution architecture lead on the field team of Imply. So I've uh, worked with clusters of all shapes and sizes uh, over many years. Oh, great to be here. Fantastic start. So first question for Sinto, what do you think is the best practice for alerting on the health of a Druid cluster? Um, Druid has a lot of metrics, so we have to be a bit careful on alerting like on all of them or else we'll get a lot of alerts. So one of the best practices I've seen is uh, something like a smoke test that sort of ingests data into Druid and then you query the data again and match them and see if things are working. That, that'll that give you a good idea if the, the cluster is healthy and at an overall level. Um, you can then dig deeper into like individual clusters like if you have queries that are slow or um, ingestion tasks that are not working and then plan plan the metrics accordingly. But the first, I think one of the best technique is having like a smoke test or something that can that can alert you on the overall health of the cluster. And um, would you say that it's more important to look at sort of Druid specific metrics that come out of the cluster or to look more into this kind of JVM specific stuff like the actual underlying processes? Uh, it depends again what the issues are. You first look into, let's say if, if it's a query issues, you figure out where the query is sort of lagging. Is it on the historical side or is it on the broker side? And then you you plan into wherever, if, if you see a lot of heap issues, you tack tackle it differently. So it will depend on uh, what the actual issue is. Cool, thank you very much. Um, another, next question um, for George. More and more people are treating infrastructure as code. How do you handle this for Druid and how does that fit into a containerization strategy? Um, yeah, I think for handling infrastructure as code for Druid, uh, generally trying to use like static templates and things like that, uh, is not going to work because it's a pretty complicated system to deploy. You need to worry about things like volumes. Um, there's an open source Druid operator, uh, at Imply. We have kind of built our own operator internally. Um, I think that's kind of the best way to try to, uh, support an infrastructure as code strategy where you deploy an operator and then you define your, your Druid infrastructure as, as a custom Kubernetes uh, resource. How are you doing that in Helm? Uh, are you templating in that or what are you, what are you using for your IC? Uh, so yeah, when you deploy an operator, you deploy the operator usually through Helm and it exposes a custom resource. So an open source Druid operator is just like uh, a Druid resource essentially and then you deploy your custom resource the way you would deploy any other resource in Kubernetes. So cool. Um, ben, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add to that one? No, I think the uh, covered it pretty well. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that in Druid, as it matures and being able to uh, containerize services uh, really helps with the um, auto scaling right now, that's kind of limited to ingestion, but there's no reason that it has to always only be limited to ingestion. So I think that it's going to be how we manage the infrastructure, especially in Kubernetes environments is really going to you know, drive the overall architecture product. Cool. Um, another question for Ben then, um, what are the most important metrics to collect on the Druid cluster? Oh boy, um, <laughs> all of them, I guess. Uh, some metrics you're going to use for like alerting. Usually that's the, the top level metrics, like the query time or ingestion lag. Um, but all of the metrics are valuable for troubleshooting issues. I think that one of the common issues that I do see is people uh, over alerting or they'll put alerts on things like, you know, historical query time or, um, you know, individual uh, metrics that 
are very useful for diagnosing issues, but really you just need to know, you know, how is the query performing? Like what's your uh, average query time, P98 query time, ingestion, you just need to know how many events are there, is there any lag? Uh, but then kind of drilling into that when you want to actually troubleshoot query performance issues, you want to be able to see every step of the query execution, what the performance looks like. So, um, yeah, I think that the Druid metrics mechanism is crucial to having a well running Druid cluster. Uh, you're not able to just glean that information from this host system. You have to actually get it from the Druid JVMs. Super distinct. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important. Like people have probably seen the Druid metrics uh, documentation. There's like hundreds of metrics on there. Uh, it can be kind of intimidating. I think it's important not to like start from there and, and try to like alert on every metric there. Uh, it's best to start with like, what are you trying to do? Usually that's monitoring ingestion or like in the last talk, uh, Ben mentioned, you know, how sometimes querying can be a little bit more forgiving, but usually you're gonna wanna measure querying as well and then you kind of start from what you're trying to accomplish and then if ingestion you know the first thing you normally would measure is lag and you know then you would sort of go from there like if lag is increasing you would want to look at the health of the overlord there are metrics that you should look at for that um and i think something like kubernetes is pretty helpful um for for running druid as well uh because druid is kind of one core concept of Druid is is it takes advantage of like cheap memory in modern systems and it uses a lot of memory. So Kubernetes is a good system for like, you know, setting, setting memory limits, things like that, telling when, when you're going over um, memory thresholds. One good thing that worked for us is having like three or four alerts and then the rest may be like dashboard. So you look at trends. If, you, if an alert fires, then you look at trends and see something has gone wrong, things like that. So. Great sting. Thank you, guys. Um, one question for the whole panel. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this. Um, what's the worst thing you can do or fail to do on a Druid cluster? Um, I guess I will start. And uh, I think the thing that I see people try to do and fail most frequently is just a lift and shift from another system. Um, you know, Druid is is a specialized tool or semi-specialized tool and uh, modeling your data for Druid, uh, modeling your queries for Druid, I think are what really lead to successful deployments. Um, if you're coming from a, you know, Microsoft Analytics Services and you have 3,000 line stored procedures that you're trying to put into Druid, uh, that, that is probably not going to work very well. So, um, you know, actually building the system the way that Druid wants it to be built, uh, for lack of a better way to say that. One basic thing I would say, I think everyone knows it, but it's things like compaction. Uh, although there would be property to say, okay, the sizes of each, let's say segments should be 700 MB or something. People don't realize that data doesn't work accordingly, right? You could have smaller segments. It's always a good idea to keep compacting the data so that you meet your sizes and things like that. Um, I also think one of the worst things you can do maybe is to do nothing. Um, Druid clusters, there's like a lot of configs as was talked about in, in the last um, talk and there's things you need to do like resizing. Obviously, Will would like us to uh, update Druid clusters more frequently, version, software versions. Um, so I think it's important to, to not be scared of updating your Druid cluster. It's important to build a system that lets you upgrade frequently. Uh, that's just kind of where it is at as a system. Yeah, I mean, I guess one thing I'll add is people often try to do too much with Druid. They will spend huge amounts of time trying to find configurations that are going to help maximize their hardware resources and oftentimes there's kind of very little return on investment uh you know, unless you're trying to address a specific 
problem. Usually the default settings are there for a reason. Um, and you know, trying to go through and customize every setting to maximize your performance will you know, at best give you a little gain, but at worst lead to instability of the cluster or more problems down the road. So you, know, you definitely, you know, all those knobs that you can turn uh, are there for a reason, but don't start turning them unless you have a clear goal that you're trying to achieve. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, another question for the three of you. Um, what are the signals to look for to determine uh, when a cluster should be scaled up? And um, how can I determine if I can safely reduce the size of my cluster without hurting performance? I guess I'll take this one also, since it's kind of ties into both things I just talked about. Um, I think the okay. when you are getting to a point that you feel like you may need to size up the cluster, the first thing is to find out where the bottlenecks are in the cluster, and this is where the metrics are very important. Um, sometimes uh, scaling up one area is not going to do anything for your performance. So if you look at the metrics and determine that you know your historical processes are the bottleneck to query performance, that's where you want to start uh, scaling up. Um, there isn't a you know clearly line that says you know the cluster is too big or too small it really comes down to your slas uh, and if you want you know faster queries scale up uh, if you can tolerate them running a little bit longer uh, maybe you don't need as much hardware as you're currently running but druid is really good about using all of the resources it has available so um well, finding that point of diminishing returns is critical and that's why the metrics are there. Yeah, if you if you look at your like even for scaling down, if you look at your CPU, maybe the max CPU usage and memory and if it's been consistently um low, that may maybe it's a sign that you can maybe scale down a bit. But again you have to like test it out and see if that doesn't have any adverse effects and stuff. Yeah, I would agree with Ben. Basically, you need to look at the components that you need to scale, right? Like, the most obvious one is, like, if you're out of disk space, then that one, like, you can just probably scale up. Um, but, like, for query, you need to look at segment wait time, segment query time, and see, you know, are these queries timing out? Do we need to scale out for ingestion? You need to look at your lag and see if it's acceptable, see if your ingestion jobs are completing quickly enough. Um, and scaling down is, is really the same thing, right? Um, just in reverse. Great stuff. Um, moving on now to some questions from the audience. Thank you to everyone who submitted those. Um, again, feel free to jump in and answer um, when you feel like you have something to say. Um, first audience question, what specific metadata um, backup slash restore practices have you seen in the wild um, and which ones would you endorse? Uh, Easy answer is back up your metadata database very often. Uh, it used to be possible to rebuild a metadata database from the segment files, but that is no longer possible and it's not going to be possible in the future. So make sure uh, your database is backing up frequently. If you do happen to need to restore, uh, luckily Druid is uh, forgiving in that whatever segment files were created after the metadata store are not going to impact future operations. So you might lose the most recent data, but when you add data back in, it's not going to get conflicts or anything like that. Um, but yeah, the easiest solution is use something like RDS and, and put on the automatic backups and don't think about it anymore. Well, think about it a little, make sure those backups are running. Um, one piece of advice I've often heard when I was working DevOps was to um, go and test your recovery methods periodically to see if they're working. Um, is there a good way of doing that with Druid in terms of going and um, recreating your metadata and things like that to make sure that your DR process for metadata is working? Or is it something that is best left alone until you really need to change it? I'm generally spoiled that I'm working with Imply and not open source Druid. So uh, it's that's abstracted away uh, for the most part. 
but yes, obviously recovering your metadata and testing out what the recovery procedure will look like uh, is important. It's also um, especially important when you have streaming data coming in, you need to understand like what your uh, re recovery time objectives are and making sure that your Kafka retention period is enough that if you do have to restore from a backup and re-ingest data, that it hasn't fallen off the Kafka topic. Yeah, I think Druid is pretty easy to restore test as someone who has done it before accidentally and on purpose. Um, you know, it's built to be restorable. You know, you just take your backup in the metadata store and you point it at your deep storage and, you know, you let it go. And like, yeah, there, you write right at the issues, like Ben said, your Kafka retention, things like that. But those are things you'll discover from the testing. Great. So thanks, guys. Um, another question from the audience. How do you evaluate new versions of Druid before you deploy them? I think um, I can take this one. Um, the best way is to have like a dedicated cluster um, that you can easily go on the newer versions. There could be bugs and everything on the newer ones. It's best to have a dedicated cluster, run some perf test, benchmarking, look at all the use cases. There could be some difference in query patterns as well. So look at those and see if everything sort of makes sense and then only uh, release it to the sort of wider audience. So that's one thing that, that will surely help. Don't let your cluster fall too far behind. <laughs> um, almost all of the problems that people have with upgrades occur when they are upgrading uh, from a version that's a, over a year old to the most recent version. Uh, the software generally has uh, backwards compatibility, but for some features, they will actually remove the code. So if you're going too many jumps in the software, uh, you could end up with problems. But regardless, having a staging environment that you can test the upgrades is very important. Also, test different features. Um, although you, there may be a new feature introduced, it may be turned off by default for backwards compatibility and you may want to, you know, turn that feature on. So you also want to be able to test your configuration changes in a non-cloud environment. Great stuff. Um, another question um, from the audience. What resource utilization level do you shoot for in production under average slash peak load conditions? This one's close to my heart, having been woken up in the small hours of the morning by databases that were using 80% of their memory, uh, which, you know, not necessarily a get out of bed kind of emergency. Yeah, this is, it very much depends on the use case that you have. Druid, um, like I mentioned before, it, it's very good at using the available hardware. So a single query can cause all of your historicals to spike up to, you know, almost 100% usage. And that's not a bad thing because that means you're using all your hardware. But it does make kind of sizing a little difficult because it's a very spiky workload. Uh, I often have people kind of complaining that they're underutilizing uh, their hardware because they see that the average CPU is under 10%. And in the Druid world, that's not bad because if you restrict it down and have your hardware, you know, averaging 50%, your query performance is definitely going to suffer because there's not enough capacity to handle those bursts of queries. Um, so... Yeah, it depends. Uh, I also have customers that have like very predictable workloads and they you know, will run their hardware much higher average loads. But generally anything over 80% average is definitely going to be problematic. Uh, but most of the clusters I work with average under 10% CPU utilization. Yeah, one thing to note is the the utilization like CPU is very spiky. So in some cases, what I've seen is the metrics are at a emitted from these underlying nodes that they're not at a, they're at a higher granularity. So what happens is you don't see those spikes and it looks like that your cluster is underutilized, but because we miss out the spikes sometimes, so that's something we need to take care of whether the metrics actually is correct or not. So yeah, that's something we have seen. Great stuff. Thanks guys. Um, another question. Um, how safe is it to perform rolling updates? 
Um, and this is asking, uh, alternatively, we've just seen a talk from Netflix on a cluster level blue-green deployment. So I guess they're, they're asking about the merits of rolling versus blue-green. I think rolling updates are generally very safe. Um, again, the problems lie when you're going between large version jumps, uh, going from Druid 30 to 31. It, very rarely will people experience any sort of issue, but if you're coming from Druid 12 and going to 31, uh, then you can have problems because there's been so many changes in the meantime. So having backwards compatibility for something that's you know, five years old is is probably not going to happen. Uh, rolling updates are, I think, not only safe, but at least I recommend them because your clusters don't need a downtime, the lot of configurations in Druid, in Kubernetes that allows you to have a graceful sort of shutdown. So it ensures that your queries don't fail, your ingestion tasks have minimum impact. So I think I totally agree that rolling updates are totally, totally safe. As long as it's between, I think, as you mentioned, between the, the window of upgrades, you don't version. Upgrade from, let's say, 24 to 20, 30 or something. If you don't do, it should be totally fine. Um, and there's a question from the audience. Um, when a node in the cluster is brought down, all queries or ingestion jobs in them will get killed. Is there a graceful way of recycling or restarting these nodes? Um, I can talk about ingestion specifically. Uh, there are like several systems now in Druid that handle some form of auto scaling ingestion, not necessarily like vertical auto scaling, but sort of more auto scaling in the sense of an AWS auto scaling group where you're trying to maintain a certain set of nodes. Um, you, you know, if you're running something like Kubernetes, you, you are going to want to have like a pre stop hook or you might have this operation d uh, defined in your uh, operator, but you would want to wait for like all, all jobs to finish on a, on a pod. And uh, that's something where the auto scaling can help uh, because if you're going sort of one by one, uh, it's going to take a long time to, you know, wait for all the tasks on one pod to uh, finish and then sort of go moving on to the next one. But if you can do something like spin up a bunch of new middle managers or ingest pods at once and then sort of schedule all the current ones for teardown and let them finish their tasks, that's uh, a good thing to do. Uh, and um, when we're talking about the historical services, uh, there is a configuration called decommissioning nodes. Um, prior to shutting down a node, if you add it to the decommissioning list, it will uh, kind of signal to the coordinator to move the segments off of that node. Um, if you are running you know, a small number of replicas, possibly even one replica, uh, shutting down a node directly could cause some data to not be available. So if you decommission it first, we'll ensure that uh, the, the data stays available no matter what. Now, even from the querying standpoint, um, you can add, as he mentioned, pre-stop hooks and to ensure that these brokers, they have a graceful shutdown. So it can only shut down when, let's say, all the queries are executed and the new ones will go to the new broker. So there's things in place that can ensure a graceful shutdown. Great stuff. Um, another question from the audience. If you could choose to fill one feature gap for Druid operators, what would it be? That's a tough one. Um, I think there are a, lo a lot of things that run in the task system now in Druid, and there are more things added yep. somewhat frequently. Like there are uh, MSQ queries, async queries, um, auto compaction. Uh, it can be kind of hard to run like sort of these kind of diverse workloads on a single set of ingest nodes, middle managers. Uh, so I think like sort of worker categories and like having tiers of middle managers is, is pretty important. Um, so I would, I would like to see sort of better support for, yeah, launching multiple tiers of middle managers of ingest and targeting tasks at, at these sort of cool 
It's really interesting. Yeah, I know I, I've had a lot of fun in the past with scaling middle managers around ingestion jobs. Um, a, the next question from the audience. How do you educate users to use Druid for the right use cases and not to treat Druid as a regular data warehouse, um, which sometimes turns costly for maintenance? I think it's tricky because if you ask a user, do you need sub-second, most of them will say yes. Um, yeah, although they may, not, they may not need it, but it's like, so it's tough to educate, but usually how we treat it is if it's serving like an application workload or you need really real-time streaming and you need data, data freshness within, let's say, a few seconds, those are good pointers to say that, okay, maybe Druid is a good fit. If the query patterns are sort of identified that you know, okay, these are the type of queries you want to run, maybe that's also a good use case rather than saying, okay, I don't know which, what, what are the type of queries, then it may slowly move into the sort of the data warehouse of, uh, field. Yeah, I guess for me, uh, since I'm you know, working at a software company, the educating users really comes as a how do you talk to potential customers to see if their use case fits with Druid? Um, and I find that pretty easy to do because I'm also on the post sale side. So I just, you know, think to myself, is this something that I want to support uh, after it's been sold? And, you know, when uh, somebody comes in with a use case that is not a good fit for Druid and, or, or would be a better fit for a different technology, um, I usually just tell them that, I guess. Uh, I don't have you know, internal stakeholders that I'm necessarily uh, educating, but part of the sales cycle is to educate the people that, that are interested in uh, Implier Druid and making sure that what they want to do is something that they can actually succeed with Druid. In stuff. Um, another question from the audience. What is your stance on NVMe local store versus network block storage and presumably that's for deep storage in a Druid cluster? Yeah, I bet. Um, nothing beats NVMe. I will say that. Uh, however, the gap between uh, direct attached storage and uh, object storage or block storage uh, has shrunk dramatically. Um, so I believe, you know, Polaris now is using all network block storage uh, and the difference between that and direct attached storage is you know, just a couple of percent. Um, so I, I think that some use cases, uh, especially ones that are very... Um, heavy with random seeks will see benefit from NVMe, uh, but doing the testing yourself and seeing if it's worth the cost is is really important. Great. I think I'm on the same page. I think UBS is a pretty good default. It also lets you do some interesting things during updates if you want to try to reattach disks um, rather than pulling down segment files. Uh, I would say like for AWS specifically, I think a pretty reasonable heuristic is if you're starting to think about changing the defaults for your EBS volumes, uh, that's when I would consider uh, NVMEs instead um, because it can be quite expensive actually to like increase IOPS and throughput on EBS volumes. In a previous life, I worked as a storage engineer at IBM and I would say on this one, particularly with um, cloud providers like AWS, you might be talking about the difference between NVMe in that box or NVMe on the floor above connected over fiber. So you, you shouldn't be trading too much latency, although certainly if it's in different regions, you're going to have a fun time. Um, but yeah, in a modern modern data center world, um, it's becoming much less of a concern, although definitely there's still room for optimization there. Um, next question from the audience. Since Druid has an abundance of configurations, where do you recommend starting um, to tune uh, where do you recommend starting to tune Druid to be more performant? Start with the problem that you're having or that you want to address. Um, I think that although it's kind of expansive, going to the uh, Druid docs and using the uh, 
recommended configs um, and just running with the recommended configs for a while uh, in production to see how it performs. And then if there are uh, problems that arise or areas that need to be addressed, you can kind of start tuning those areas. But you shouldn't just go in blind without a baseline test um, on that. So, you know, keeping those metrics so that you can easily compare and do the you know, analyze performance before the change versus after the change. Um, yeah, so make sure you are tuning to a specific goal and not just fiddling with things, uh, trying to make a nebulous concept better yeah i think i have had a very good experience with the the recommended read recommended configs things like your segment size the merge buffers and stuff like that you start with that see if it's um is doing good and then it's easy to scale up druid does very good in like scaling up and down so you can always have those settings and then scale up your individual services to see if if that works usually that that's pretty good uh, place to start with so um, another um, disaster recovery question. Have you seen any mature processes for manual recovery from failed ingestion conditions? Um, for example, using spot instances for catch-up indexing. I think that the auto-scaling of middle managers has largely made uh, that moot. Um, oh, whether you're using spot instances or k pods or, or however, um, it allows you to dynamically scale the ingestion uh, to, you know, handle a backlog of data. Um, I I don't know that spot instances alone would the savings of a spot instance over a reserved instance would be that much for an auto scaling type of use case. Uh, yeah. But also keep in mind that, uh, your ingestion can only scale to as many partitions that you have. So that could end up being your limiting factor, not the actual ingestion tasks. A, uh, follow-up question here to our earlier question around cost utilization. You mentioned spikes in utilization from expensive queries are not necessarily a bad thing as it means the cluster is being fully utilized. What strategies do you recommend to avoid longer running expensive queries from blocking or negatively affecting other queries? If I'm not. I think, yeah, Druid has things like tiering and laning. And so um, if you know which are your, let's say, good queries from bad queries, you can always lane it uh, correctly so that you have an allocated set of uh, resources for, let's say, the expensive queries. Or, you know, maybe the users are playing with Druid, so you know those go to um, the other lane, and you have a P0, let's say, lane that that has dashboard queries, which are more critical. So Druid has inbuilt features for this, so it should it should work. Yeah, I think that you know, there's a lot of different strategies that can be used to to isolate resources. Um, but managing your query timeout is kind of the unsung hero of of those configurations. The since we can't like physically restrict how many cores a query uses, uh, we can only really control the concurrency. Um, having a timeout that is realistic helps. And when I say realistic, having too short of a timeout will just cause a user to resubmit the same query a bunch of times and continually just kind of slamming the cluster. Uh, but having one that's too long, if the um, user browses away from the page that's running that query, chances are good that it's going to still remain running. It's not going to kill the query. So you want to be protective of uh, your cluster resources, but kind of keep in mind that users are more or less predictable in that if something isn't coming back in single digit seconds, uh, they're either going to refresh the page and issue a new query or give up um, on it. The other thing I'll say is try to keep your workloads uh, consistent or at least don't mix 
kind of the ad hoc, very spiky workloads with like a consistent workload of API traffic. Um, if the data, you know, is small enough and you can actually run two separate clusters, that's the best way to isolate resources. Um, so you don't have to worry about laning and tiering. You just, uh, segregate everything based on which cluster it's going to. Great stuff. Um, another question from the audience. For segment related performance problems, in your opinion, what common pitfalls should be avoided when doing some troubleshooting? Uh, as was mentioned before, we kind of have a general guideline of uh, 300 to 700 megabyte segment sizes. Uh, compaction is a great way to keep those segment sizes um, in that range. I think whenever possible, limiting your late arriving data is the best way to uh, keep those segment sizes appropriately sized and reduce the amount of compaction that's actually necessary. Uh, having a long tail of late arriving data pretty much guarantees that compaction is going to be constantly running, uh, constantly using more resources on your cluster. So if the data is no longer valuable, you know, if an event has a timestamp from 1998, uh, often it's safe to throw that away rather than having Druid create a segment for it. Great stuff. Um, one thing I would always suggest as well is keep a very close eye on your ingestion granularity. Um, because if you are, I've seen examples where people have been ingesting with very small segments and they have a lot of data coming in very quickly and they end up with thousands and thousands of segments in a day and that will absolutely eat your performance. So yeah, always, always think, um, about your data modeling and your, uh, granularity for ingestion. Uh, we have some really good documentation on that in, uh, the courses on learn.imply.io around data modeling and Druid. So do check it out if you're having trouble with that. Um, another question from the audience. How often do you suggest your user to apply custom resource settings in the query context object of the request? I usually suggest it right before making a change. Um, setting the properties in the query context allows you to test configurations without applying it at the cluster level. In most cases, you know, having per query configurations is overkill, but, um, if you're trying to address a specific issue, if you're, you know, getting the max subquery rows exceeded and you want to test, you know, what, if you can set it higher without having performance issues, doing so in the query context is very valid, but eventually, um, I would recommend moving those configurations after they're thoroughly tested into the runtime configuration so you don't have to set it with every query. But things like priority and uh, timeout, setting those in the context can really be helpful because you know, those are things that each query could be treated differently. Um, if you have a long running query, you might want to set the priority very low and have a high timeout versus your interactive queries, which lower timeout, higher priority. Great answer. Um, another question from the audience. Real-time ingestion has to create uh, a new segment where data falls into a new segment granularity. How can we protect against a rush to create segment calls at the top of the hour? Uh, I assume this is like assuming that, you know, there's like an hour task duration and then, uh, there's intermediate handoffs configurations. Um, I think just going with the defaults is usually a good place to start. Um, and that kind of lets this whole, the, the Druid handoff sort of feature during streaming can like be a thorn sometimes because, uh, like the question says, you, you get a bunch of segment calls that are lined up, you end up with a bunch of tasks being launched at the same time as well. Um, intermediate handoff is, is kind of built to try and address that. There are also some features that have been added to supervisors, uh, stop task count, uh, early handoff of tasks, um, that are potentially also worth looking into to like sort of, um, add some jitter into the, the task handoff times. 
Yeah, I, I generally only see kind of the rush of new segments being a problem on um, clusters that are running a very high number of tasks. Uh, you know, if you run 200 tasks, it's going to open 200 new segments uh, you know, at the hour. I don't think that that's something that's unmanageable. Um, usually we don't have to do any specific configurations to handle that kind of volume, but things like the stop task count, uh, where instead of having all 200 tasks shut down at the same time and spin up 200 new ones, uh, roll over the, the uh, tasks in groups uh, can really not only help the performance in that aspect, but also have minimized the flood of uh, traffic to the metadata database when tasks are rolling over. Super interesting. One final question from the audience before we wrap up our session with these awesome panelists today. Um, when auto scaling ingestion, how do you ensure a balanced load across indexing tasks since Kafka partitions may not divide equally among those tasks? Well, uh, if your Kafka partitions are not balanced, there's no way to uh, balance the indexing tasks. So make sure your, your Kafka partitions is balanced is the easiest way. Um, the other have a note is the larger the, um, larger the middle manager is, the more it kind of has a natural load balancing effect. So if you have uh, one middle manager with 10 task slots, you have a smaller risk than if you have 10 small middle managers with one task slot each. Because in that case, if one of those tasks is very heavy, um, it can cause overall slowness. Whereas if you have 10 slots, you know, you might have some that are heavier than others, but it all kind of balances out. Great stuff. Thank you for that. Well, we had some really uh, deep dive technical stuff uh, in those questions from the audience there. So can we have a huge hand for our panelists for their great job of answering that? Yeah.